So welcome back to another video and today we are discussing and comparing north facing solar arrays to south facing solar arrays because this is a popular topic. Lots of people have different opinions on the performance of solar panels facing north and some people think it's totally pointless. Well, we had the opportunity to not only review some data, some real life data about a property that has both elevations, but we were also able to sit down with the client and interview them about their journey, their road to net zero and why they opted for north facing panels. Let's get into it. So as a quick background to why this client did this, this is a property that has an enormous amount of energy demand because when you're looking to go net zero and you're electrifying your home, you're going to use a lot of energy. And we're talking here around 20,000 kilowatt hours per year for one property. And that's because all of their heating the majority of their transport and their energy is all powered from electricity. Now, it's not really a standard home. This is a pretty impressive property that's got outbuildings. They've got a pool with, I think, like eight tons of heated water in there, a resistance, one of these jet ones that you swim against. So it's not really a typical property, but if you scale that system down, if you've got lower demand, you can achieve the same result. So rather than me tell you about the layout of the system and the home, let's let the client explain it to you. Yeah, so we've got a, um, a broadly south facing array, which was our first one, which is 16, 455 kilowatt panels. So that's seven point, just under 7.3 kilowatts in total. Um, and that's on a, like a legacy solar edge uh, system. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, feeding currently two Tesla Powerwall batteries, and we're putting a third one in today. So yeah. overall, our battery capacity will be 40 kilowatts um, with the three Tesla batteries, and obviously input output on that is 15,000 kilowatts, which is huge. Yeah. Um, so that's you know. how we started. But where did we come into this journey? Well, we were invited by the customer to come and quote for some additional products in his home, namely a solar array and a battery. And here's what we agreed on. So those those panels there originally, they were on, they've been on for about two years, I think. Yeah, two years. The generation was more than we thought on it, but yeah. clearly not enough to cover the uh, usage of the house over an annual period. And in the diet sense, we needed to consume less and we needed a bit more generation. So uh, we got in touch with you guys to obviously do another array on the other side of the uh, This is this house. north. It's northeast, is that, is it? Yeah, um, yeah, give or take. So we've got those, the REA panels. two panels um, on there. They're on um, microinverters as well, aren't they? On microinverters. Yeah. Now we got round to installing the system in July. I think it was the 1st or 2nd of July, 2023. And we have data from that point, because obviously two of those power walls and that existing solar array were pre-existing and we weren't privy to any of the information. When we added that third power wall, we suddenly were able to see all the load, we were able to see all the generation of both systems, but we couldn't backdate anything. So everything we're talking about today is from when we got involved. Now when we wired the system, what we did is we put the CT clamps which measure solar production around both systems. And then what we've been able to do is, as one of those systems is N phase, we can track how much we've generated in, this, in the N phase app. We can then compare that to the total generation in the Tesla app deduct what we know about Enphase, and we then know what the other system produced. As the client told you, his first system was on the southwest, so sort of an optimal location, because the southwest you get midday sort of generation and you get all that evening sun. We were up against it here because we were on the north, east so not only was it the north but it was also pointing away from evening sun we got a little bit of morning generation right let's start with n phase so i've brought some pace notes here to help me along because this is a lot of data so what i've actually done here on the n phase screen is i've set the lifetime generation so we can see the system was actually active from the 1st of july 2024 until today, the 9th of January, 2025. So we've basically got like six months worth of generation. 
Now, with end phase, you can see each individual panel's performance. So, as you can see, top left here, you've got 108 kilowatt hours. Right at the bottom, we've got 122 kilowatt hours. And then on the bottom left, which is our lowest performing panel, because that panel would be span round, it would be the furthest northeast panel. So it's got the lowest chance of any generation, 96.4. First thing to point out is the beauty of Enphase. Enphase has individual panel performance. So each panel is a power plant. These have the Enphase IQ8, HCs. So this is the ACM version of the panel that we have. It's the one that comes bonded from the factory and it's sort of supported and endorsed by Enphase. Now one thing that's really interesting about Enphase is that individual performance and when you compare this to a string system you do get more generation because on this array which has zero shading issues but does struggle because it is northeast this optimization prevents the lowest performing panel pulling down the rest of the system. Because if this was a string system, every single panel would have performed to 96.4 and that would have produced 1.73 megawatt hours, where in fact we were able to produce 2.06 megawatt hours. So about 300 kilowatt hours extra generation. If you take that over six months, that's nearly 600 megawatt hours of additional generation just by having this system set up on microinverters. Now it's really important for this property because clearly the client uses a lot of energy. So we know how Enphase performed, we know what we were able to produce with those REA ACMs, but how did the rest of the system perform? Well, to do that, we need to go on to the Tesla portal. And again, we only have data from this Tesla when we joined that Tesla ecosystem. And this is the background. This is like the engineer profile of the Tesla monitoring app. And what's really good about it is on the left-hand side here, we can start to do some comparisons and isolate certain bits of data that we want to graph. But before we do that, Let's just take a quick look at some of the headlines at the top. The first thing we need to do is set our date range. So if we match it up to the date range of when that end phase system went live, which was the 1st of July, there we go. And we update it. Those graphs are now gonna update at the top. And we can see our load for that six month period here was 10.8 megawatt hours. So again, you double that quick maths because this is a six month period, 12 months, you're going to get around 20.1 uh, megawatt hours of energy usage. We generated 4.6 megawatt hours. So the first quick analysis here, I used a percentage calculator to do this. The REA system on that north east roof generated 44% of the total production. Now both systems are pretty similar in their kilowatt peak, their maximum power. However, obviously the microinverters have a maximum AC output of 385 watts each, whereas the other system obviously is only limited by the hybrid inverter. So they're almost identical with the REA system being a couple of hundred um, watts more powerful in its kilowatt peak, but it did 44% of the energy even on that north roof. And obviously it was helped massively by the fact it was microinverters and these high performance panels, because if it was a string system on a standard panel, it probably would have done a lot less. Now solar generation is one element of your renewable journey. But when you've got a property that has high demand, or maybe you've got a roof that isn't in an optimal position, then using your batteries to support your load is something that is crucial to the success of your system. And the client talks about this. Actually, you'd think with all the generation, you just charge up your batteries and you use the sunlight that you generated yeah. um, in order to power your house. Um, but actually what we're doing is we are sending our generation out to power other people's houses and getting paid on the export for that. And then what we're doing is we're charging the batteries up overnight on green energy, overnight energy when there's surplus on the grid, and we're paying 7p for that. So because the export is more than the import, it yeah. makes sense to export everything we can and use the cheap green energy overnight from wind or whatever's going on on the grid uh, okay. to power our house. So the reality is we're actually 
pulling in someone else's wind power or whatever it might be at midnight to charge the batteries and we're using that in the day and then the solar power that we're generating Apparently is doing the neighbor's house. Now on the subject of exporting energy, Tesla also gives us that data as well. So top right hand side here, we've exported 2.74 megawatt hours. Obviously we have done a lot of that from charging the batteries up and allowing the solar system to export. And I think sometimes we've actually forced the batteries to the grid as well. But just in six months, that's around £420 in terms of export payments over 12 months. That would be like £850 a year just from export. Let's take a look at some of the comparisons below. So one of the first graphs we're gonna look at here is the solar energy produced in watt hours. Now this is the combined production from both systems and it's done across each week of the month. So as you can see here in August, we produced around 424 kilowatt hours of solar PV power. Now this is where solar really struggles in winter compared to summer. If we go to a typical week in um, November, we're down to sort of 50 kilowatt hours of production. So there's a big difference between winter and summer as you have with solar. But this is where batteries really start to come in play because now this customer, we added this third power wall. He's now got 40 kilowatt hours of storing potential and he charges them up at night. So let's take a look at some of the battery discharge compared to load and the charging across that same period. Now, what I've compiled here is the battery real-time power compared to the real load power. So the battery power is shown as a negative value because it's discharging from a set point and that's the blue graph. And then the green sort of turquoise color is our load. What we're looking really here to do is match the opposite. So what we can see in summer, our battery really isn't having to perform as hard because we've got solar generation. But as we start to drop into those low generation months, our battery power sort of spiking up there at 9,000 watts or nine kilowatts. But interestingly, it never ever struggles to cover our load. So our highest load is sort of nine kilowatt and our maximum discharge is nine kilowatts. So we are staying within the envelope of the loads of the property. And that's because the customer charges it up at night for like 7p. He then allows that battery to power the home and any solar production that is available then powers that property. And this is how he's making it work for himself. Now, again, just to quickly go back, this is a huge property with loads of demand. He's got a massive system. But if you scale this back to the demand in your home, you can achieve the same result. But you have to have a battery working hard in the background and you have to have enough capacity. So how can we summarize north facing arrays? Well, this is one of the few instances where we've been able to do a direct comparison between having a south and a north array. And actually in this instance, it was really weighted against that northeast array because northeast is about the worst orientation for solar. And we definitely see that in the winter months when that sun is a lot lower in the sky, you've got much less opportunity to capture generation. Still, with all of those challenges, the system was performing exceptionally to achieve around 45% of the production of that south array is super impressive. And this is all down to the quality of the components on the roof. Now, if you had a lower demand in this property and you had that southwest roof space, we probably wouldn't advise doing both sides of the roof because it's gonna add additional cost. And unless you're gonna to need to harness, capture and use that energy, you're probably just gonna export it and it's never gonna pay itself back. But if the north roof is the only option you have, or you've got high demands and you want to maximize your roof space, then don't be put off it. It is definitely working for this client. But there are two key considerations. The first one is the quality of the kit. You want to make sure that you've got high performance kit on your roof that can capture anything, any low light, 
to give you as much power as possible. But the second and most important one is battery support. You have to have a decent sized battery, a large capacity battery with a good transfer rate to make use of north panels. And that's because you need to support that array as much as possible. We saw that in those graphs. Those batteries are working really, really hard in winter and the client is able to buy that energy very cheap and he's still making this pay. And on that subject, let's find out directly from the client, has this been worth it? Is he saving any money? Over the last few years, we've gone to uh, net zero with a house, so it was an EPC D rated house when we first moved in. Okay. Um, and uh, with all the install that we've done uh, with you guys, we're now EPC A rated. Um, so we're over 100 on the EPC score, wow. um, which in theory means we're net zero and self sufficient. We were heading towards a four figure a month just electricity bill. We're currently only, we've got a small direct debit for £100 a month with Octopus. It'd probably go lower than that. My anticipation is we could get to zero on our electricity yeah. bill. And paying 100 and you would have been paying regionally, what, £12,000 a year originally? Yeah, at least. Uh, so. so there you have it, some pretty impressive savings for a property that's using 20 megawatt hours of energy a year to have a standing order with Octopus for £100 a month is pretty impressive. If he was buying all that energy from the grid, it'd probably cost him around five and a half to six thousand pounds. He's now got a bill which he says he doesn't actually need to pay of only twelve hundred pounds a year. So it does pay to invest in this technology. And like we said, don't be put off if you don't have the optimal roof orientation we can calculate it for you we can supply you high performance kit but we need to support it with batteries if you want to find out how much energy you could produce on a north array or for your home for an optimal array then you can do this on the heatable website we have a solar draw tool so you can draw your roof areas you can add multiple arrays and you can choose your orientation and it will calculate based on mcs figures how much energy you are likely to produce. And another guarantee with Heatable is you will only ever have high quality equipment installed in your home. So if you've got any questions, drop them in the comments box below, or if you've got a North Facing Array or you're an installer that has experience with North Facing Arrays, then please do leave a comment because as much information as we can gather for our viewers, the better. And just before I go, don't forget to subscribe to the Heatable YouTube channel and give this video a like.